Hi, Andrew. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm good. A little tired, but I'm fine. Good? T- are you tired? Yeah, I've just been uh, running around a little too much. Yeah. Would you like to catch a little nap or just ah. 90 seconds of shut-eye? No, I slept I slept 10 hours last night, so I should be fine. But, you know, some, you have no excuse sometimes after you sleep 10 hours, um, you feel more tired at the end of it than you do at the beginning. But I, I've noticed that myself. Uh, it can make things worse. Um, so, uh, well, first of all, presumably you need no introduction. You're Andrew Sullivan. There's only one of you. Um, and how do you like to be introduced? I mean, you're a lot of things. You were editor of the New Republic when I was there. You've written a lot of books. You, you of course, you were a pioneering blogger, and, and your blog, The Dish, uh, which you only decided to uh, retire from recently, was a dominant force for a long time, and so on. What's your prefer? And, of course, you're writing for New York right now, and, and that's what we're going to talk about, a piece you wrote on tribalism. What else is there to say? I don't know. I, I you know, I, I think of myself really as a writer. That's all. Um, and uh, I think that's a pretty, pretty simple explanation of everything that I do. I've tried different forms, different platforms, uh, and I've sort of returned back to writing essays, which I think is the thing that I probably do best and the thing I think I get most out of. Um, uh, I think blogging was wonderful, but I think to some extent blogging, when you do it as many times a day as I was doing it, is just not sustainable for a human being for very long, certainly mm-hmm. not more than 15 years. I don't want to do the even worse, which is tweet, um, which becomes mindless and meaningless. So I'm kind of back to essays, and I'm doing this weekly weekly diary for New York Mag on a Friday, which I skipped this week because I, I was just too tired and too, had too much going on. But uh, normally every Friday. So that's a, you know, and then I'm working on a, uh, I'm putting together a collection of my my work, uh, which is kind of absurdly large right now. And then I'm. You mean in book? In book form, form yeah, that's the idea. Uh-huh. Um, and then I'm, I'm supposed to be, and don't tell my editor, <laughs> I'm struggling with a book about um, religious life and uh, religious practice uh, in my own life and some sort of explanation of the kind of Christianity that I'm still attached to. You mean don't tell your editor that you're struggling with it? Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Your secret is safe yes, with me. Yes, anybody else. I know. So uh, you wrote this piece on tribalism, got a lot of attention, and it's funny how, meaning tribalism in America today, uh, it's funny how the word has entered the political vocabulary. I mean, you know, to describe the uh, the mindset of uh, various clans, certainly including uh, pro-Trumpers and anti-Trumpers. Um, now, you you know, you paint a pretty dark picture up front. I mean, you know, bringing up uh, things like the Balkans and uh, you know, as cautionary tales and so on, and you. You believe this is worse than the '60s, right? That's an interesting comparison because there was more, there was more like revolutionary agitation and violence, right? There were more like bombings and things. But I, I agree, and you know, I, I actually remember the '60s. I mean, I was a kid, but I, I vaguely remember the vibe, and uh, there does seem to be something that's different. I mean, it was very, you know, there was. Uh, it was not a harmonious era, but there is something different. I mean, how do you characterize the difference? Well, I think the 60s was just a rupture in culture and ideas. So there was a fight about those things. There was obviously a fight about the Vietnam War, which was kind of central to it. And then there was a huge revolution in the culture, which divided people. So it was fought over some two pretty profound issues, I think. And yes, you could name any number of issues that are involved right now, but it seems to be to be much more bound up with people's own identity um, and a lingering identity, not just a passing identity that makes it seemingly more intractable and more tribal in the sense that it goes deeper. It's not so much about an issue that will come and go as opposed to a condition that seems to be uh, very hard to dislodge and seems to be worse, becoming more entrenched. And, and because, as I try to do in the piece, because there are a whole variety of 
aspects of that identity that do not seem to me to be likely to disappear or get better over time. If anything, if we are right in identifying how these tribes have emerged, uh, then the prognosis isn't terribly good. I mean, there's a possibility that a, a political figure may emerge that can unwind this dynamic. But then when I look at someone like Obama, who of all people, it seems to me, was primed to be able to dislodge this um, uh, and failed, not for lack of trying, but failed, then then it's hard for me to think of anybody else with that level of talent and ability who could possibly overcome Well, of course, the standard reaction, or at least from, from some contingent of anti-Trumpers, is he was black, and that's why they didn't like him. Or at least that's why he had trouble making them like him or something, right? So they would say, well, if you just want a healing figure, no, you, you, you need a white person. I mean, not that they are happy about that fact, but, 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 but they would... They would, you know. Well, you know, th then they then they picked a white person, and she did a lot worse than he did among the key demographic. Yeah, well. <laughs> I know. Well, then you they yeah. could say no white person. I know. I know. She's the worst possible figure. She, in some ways. <laughs> yeah. Let's not call her the worst possible white person. I can think of worse possible white people, and I might even argue that one is in the white well, no, house. I mean, but but no, she she was a she was a horrible candidate. I mean. She was a she was a bad candidate. I mean, she just went in with a lot of uh, dislike of her. Yes, but I think, and that's a bad feature. But I think more importantly, for the point purpose of our discussion, she's very much a tribal figure. Um, she very much represents one tribe, and and the fact of her being female also underscored that tribal loyalty. And she ran as a sort of tribal figure. I mean, dismissing half of her opponent supporters as deplorable at one point. This is not. These are not arguments about ideas. They're about what kind of people I like and who support me. Um, she was a pretty bad example, so maybe there's a potential uh, non-biracial person who can come along and, and do this, and I certainly hope that's the case, and I'm certainly not a historical determinist, so who knows. But it doesn't look pretty... I don't think if she'd been elected president, so say in the piece, it would have made things any better. I think it might have made things even worse, actually. Now, at the end of the uh, piece, you flirt with the idea that Trump could wind up, ironically, being uh, the figure who brings healing. But let's let's put that discussion off uh, and keep people on the edge of their seats and do a little more in the way of uh, in the way of diagnosis. So you mentioned identity. So in your view, this is identity politics on both sides to some extent. Yeah. And quite who started it is sort of beside the point at this at this point. I mean, I think I think they both made each other worse over time. Um, but I think, and I certainly think, the rise of identity politics on the left has been a bad thing, insofar as it has entrenched this kind of tribalism by referring constantly to who one is rather than what one believes. Um, but uh, I also think that there is a quite natural and understandable and human response to a massive shift in ethnic, racial, and cultural identity in America, which has happened over the last 30 to 40 years with mass immigration, the, 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 the full iteration of what happened in the 60s, uh, racial dissension, uh, and all the rest of it that, is, that has rendered these two tribes more entrenched than they might otherwise have been. Yeah, now you, you do emphasize uh, ethnic and religious lines yeah. in, in the piece, that... that and 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 almost you don't quite make them sound like a force of nature, but you you make you make them sound like these uh, kind of inherently challenging lines to cross over lines of ethnicity and religion. And I was wondering, I mean, is the correlation that strong? In other words, um, I mean, first of all, there are a lot of white anti-Trumpers. Yes, um, there are. There were a surprising number of uh, Latino votes for Trump, although clearly a minority. Uh, the black vote, the turnout was not that high, suggesting that there wasn't a tremendous amount of identification in a tribal way with one side. Um, you know, and then religiously, yeah, there's a lot of conservatives in Trump's constituency. I mean, a lot of uh, Christians in, in Trump's constituency. Uh, on the other hand, the, 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 the leading 
edge of agitation, the alt right, is is not particularly Christian, and and uh, many of them would be avowedly atheist. Um, so I don't know. I wondered is it is it that uh, you know is that really what we're seeing? And then of course there are a number of Christians on the left, although they tend to be of different denominations than than the Christians on on the right. Well, uh, but the latest you know survey showed that um, you know it used to be that white Christians, uh, to use a very broad term. Um, was split pretty evenly between the two parties. Now it's 76%, I think, well, no, I think it's 70% Republican, 30% Democrat. And if you look at the uh, sort of atheist non-believers, they're massively tilted towards the Democrats. So that is relatively new, I think, that you have one party increasingly understood to be non-religious or secular, and the other party increasingly religious. And in fact, People who used to white, who used to and religious, who used to be part of the Democrats, have clearly moved into the Republican camp. So that's worrying. Um, the racial stuff. You're right. I mean, I'm not sure about the black vote because I think Obama might be the exception to these things. We mm -hmm. might have an artificially high, still overwhelmingly for Hillary for all sorts of <laughs> reasons. Um, uh, uh, and you're right about Latinos. 29% the same as Romney, but still, we're talking about, and Asian Americans went down considerably. If you think about where they were in the, in the early 2000s and where they are now, it seems that they have pretty much moved in that direction of, of one party. And obviously, we're not talking about 100%, we're talking about a, a, weighted, a weighted imbalance. And that imbalance, mm -hmm. it, my concern is it compounds itself because it creates an atmosphere within each particular tribe that makes it harder and harder, in fact, to reach out to the other, especially when we're talking about ethnicity as an identity and religion as a, as a core uh, part of identity. And I'm, I'm concerned about those two issues because they have historically been the key triggers for tribal identity. I mean, they're, they're, they're very deep. Okay, we are back. We had technical difficulties, uh, and we are going to pick up the conversation where... We think it more or less left <laughs> off. So continue to. Uh, well, I was I was talking mind. about why, in fact, when you see this pattern of ethnicity defining political allegiance, uh, as well as religious uh, identity uh, dictating or at least leading to political allegiance, you, you're you're on two very dangerous grounds because ethnicity and religion have historically been the solid triggers for for tribal conflict or tribal identity. And, and so when that starts to happen, when we're not talking really about ideas or differences about changing events or changing circumstances, uh, then, then I think you're in a dangerous ground. And to some extent beneath all of this, I have to say, is observing the West the last few years, and maybe it's been reading too many reactionary tracts as I have, but um, I worry. I worry about the viability politically of a truly multiracial, multicultural society that 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 we've we've embraced historically at a very very fast rate. It, it, the change has been much greater than most people seem to understand, uh, both in this country and, and also in Europe too, where these 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 things are beginning to emerge as well. And I I think. Some of us were a little too uh, complacent about the ease with which a democratic, unified culture can emerge out of such an extraordinary diversity. In other words, diversity can actually, at some point, if taken too far or if, 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 if it increases too quickly, can actually lead to political tribalism and dysfunction. Mm -hmm. I mean, one reason I ask about what we should think of as the dividing lines is one set of dividing lines you hear a lot about is kind of nationalism versus cosmopolitanism, right? And, and in this view, you could say that this is almost an inevitable tension as globalization proceeds. Yep. It was kind of bound to happen as you have better educated, more affluent people, uh, more involved with people from other countries, uh, benefiting more maybe from international trade, uh, and if you want to include immigration in globalization, although it's not an intrinsic part of it, the way economic entanglement is, but but still, um, you know, you could say that well, it's the it's the more affluent people who are who are 
benefiting from and are not threatened by economically the importation of low wage workers and, and, and so on. So in that view, you know, you could say what's fundamental is this tension uh, between nationalism and globalism, cosmopolitanism, internationalism. And then it so happens that there's some degree of correlation with other lines, like with, uh, you know, uh, with, you know, the more uh, conservative religions, the, the, the ones with the less liberal theology, the denominations with the less liberal theologies and so on are, you know, those are, uh, that's correlated with less education. Less education is on, you know, is uh, kind of naturally in a certain sense correlated with the, the nationalist group and yeah. so on. So, I, I mean, that's a... And, and, and also you can the look at urban Europe, rural, you know, the the urban rural divide that that... Right, and, and uh, yeah, and that maps largely onto the, onto the globalism and cosmopolitan yeah. thing, right. Uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, you could view that as more fundamental. I, I'm well, not, here's, here's, uh, what, here's what my, you know, members of my family say about England now, where they go to London. Um, it's like London's an amazing city, but it's not our capital city anymore. It's it's the city of somewhere else. It's as if a spaceship has landed in the middle of England and has almost no relationship to the country that, that has given its birth. And that's that's a remarkable phenomenon, it seems to me. Um, I, I, the and you can disentangle that from the new racial mix of London, in which I think almost almost half of the half of the uh, population of London is now non non white English, as it were. Um, and that also creates a different dynamic and feel. Now, the white people that, that are there, the highly educated, global, cosmopolitan people like you and me, uh, have a ball and love the diversity of cultures. And, and London works as a city remarkably. I, I love going there because it feels like I haven't really gone anywhere. I, I mean, I, I've gone from one big blue city in America to another big blue city in, in England. But... That is a bubble that we've missed. You know, we've missed the fact that for many people, the core meaning of their identity has shifted. And what they think of as their national identity has been eroded. Um, and so they're in a defensive crouch, which intensifies this tribal response. And then when the cosmopolitans respond to that defensive crouch by calling them bigots and xenophobes and all the rest of it, uh, then, then also pride gets involved and, and, and you start this it can build on itself. That's my, I mean, that, I'm not saying anything particularly new, but what I'm trying to say is that let's recognize this within a rubric which we're used to recognizing in other countries, which is tribalism, and see whether there's, whether we're in danger of falling into that kind of trap. And I think we are. I mm -hmm. think it, and I'm extremely worried about how you actually get out of it. Yeah, yeah it's problematic. I, I mean, uh, it's it, uh, because once you identify strongly with a tribe and view the other tribe as antagonistic, it just affects your processing of all the information in ways that is not conducive to clarity. No. Uh, the the uh, to say the um, least. And 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 you yeah. know, I draw on and it's your specialty, evolutionary biology, uh, to understand quite how this part of human nature operates. Um, and we have to remember that really there has never been. Uh, in the past, truly multiracial, multicultural democracies on a, at a national level. There have been multiracial, multicultural empires in which, in which all sorts of, uh, you know, whether it be the Ottoman Empire, or even the British Empire, which have managed, there have been multicultural, multiracial cities and ports where trade and so on has, but we haven't seen this on an actual national scale the way we are. And we're only seeing it in the West, you're not seeing it in Japan, you're not seeing it in China, you're not seeing it in Russia, all of whom have maintained really quite remarkably homogeneous ethnic, religious or non-religious uh, identities. Um, and I think this is a bigger challenge than most of us want to believe. Uh, and I think we can say that without excusing racism. And this is the difficulty. You know, you, you, I don't want to excuse it uh, or xenophobia. Uh, but I do want to understand it and not treat it as some sort of weird aberration in human history as opposed to the norm in human history that our current situation yeah. is aggravating. Yeah, it's 
it, it, it's true that there aren't a lot of obvious long-term success stories in that regard. I mean, I would say that it's it's far from being some kind of consensus view among evolutionary psychologists that ethnicity is intrinsically uh, some kind of uh, hard uh, this hard chasm to bridge. Um, and uh, I mean, you you quote one person in your piece, Dominic Johnson, who I think is on one side of this and has, uh, I think he's probably kind of a group selectionist and so on. I don't want to get into all that, but I, I mean, a lot of psychologists have documented how, how readily, how malleable people are in terms of what exactly the tribal marker is. I mean, I think there's an experiment where they just tell kids to, you guys put on the red jerseys and you put on the right. green, and like right away, you yeah. know, uh, even if the groups are internally ethnically diverse, red and green becomes the boundary line. So I, I don't think I don't think uh, we should be too pessimistic on the grounds that ethnicity is uh, there's some correlation with ethnicity here. I mean, I think the main I think that uh, there are causes for pessimism, uh, j partly just the way that once you get tribal psychology going, it's a positive feedback system. The more tribal one side is, the more tribal the other side is. And that's why I was very worried about this, uh, and I still am, about the Nazi punching thing. That takes it to a whole new level. And that's obviously, you know, when you start using violence for something other than self-defense, um, that's just a whole new well, kind of Well, tribalization inevitably means more and more dehumanization of the other tribe um, to justify yourself and to... And so that has a logic of its own um, that if not restrained aggressively, the question is what forces are out there to to restrain this? How do we if we accept that this is a trend in human nature, that this is something we have to look out for and worry about, what is it that binds us back together? And, and the trouble is, you know, the nation state has historically been that medium sort of tribalism, as it were. Um, and one of the things I try and talk about in the piece is that is that there are sort of very benign forms of tribalism, say uh, Rangers versus Celtics in Glasgow, you know, which actually map onto Protestant and Catholic identities, but nonetheless have become football teams. I mean, we, we channel some of this stuff through that kind of identity, which is completely harmless, actually very, I think, uh, beneficial in a way, because we siphon off some of these feelings that way. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other is, uh, is, is, is the national identity, which again can unify us tribally in a way that can help a democracy because we all believe that we're in the same basic boat and we all have the same common future. It's when the tribalist impulses operate in the intermediate area, <laughs> uh, between local harmless stuff and national harmless stuff to, in which a country is divided, in, especially when it's divided equally in two, in which it does seem to me that that it's it's not far from the truth that people would be happy to sacrifice the national interest if it if it achieved their own tribal interest at this point. Um, they may not admit that, but I think you look at what happens in the world, and part of you is thinking, well, yes, that might be an unbelievable shitstorm, but at least it'll hurt Trump. Yeah, let me. Uh... Say a couple things about the nation state. First of all, maybe a source of optimism should be that the nation state wasn't exactly an instinctively natural category. It took building. You know, it was like before the nation state, the various towns that came to constitute the nation state had antagonisms. Often they spoke dialects that were so distinct that they almost seemed like different languages. And in fact, a certain amount of actual evolution of language and standardization of language had to take place. So. You know, I mean, the, uh, Benedict Anderson, I think, wrote this, uh, you know, coined this phrase, imagined communities, was it? Uh, and pointed out that the nation states is this incredibly artificial thing. It's bizarre that you can be in San Francisco and think of this person in Florida as your brother. And yet, that kind of thing has, the, you know, that humankind made that transition. <clears throat> so uh, that should give us hope. Yes, yes, um, but not without some troubles along the way. I mean, this country... Uh terrifying civil war that was incredibly bloody um also when you think of i think of where i grew up which is sort of in england which is in some ways a quintessential nation state that emerged in the 16th century uh uh and it it, it is a construction but it's a construction that nonetheless did work and then they attempted a construction of britain 
of the British identity. And that worked as far as an imperial entity does, but in modern times itself has ceased to operate quite as well as it might. The Scottish, the Welsh, and the Irish identities have, have reserved. Um, the one big difference I see in Britain today, as I did growing up, is that you would never have seen the English flag fly in England 30 years ago. And the English flag is the is the, the red St. George's flag on a white background, as opposed to the Union Jack. Yet now it's ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, really? And Not in London or in other parts of All England? over, all over the place. Yes, it is the... It's, and is, does it signify Brexit, basically? Is it, it has a lot. It has some ramification to that, yes. I mean, there was a classic moment in a recent election campaign where someone saw... There's the white, there's the white band, they call it, which is kind of a working class kind of little mini truck kind of thing they have in England. And it was in front of a, a brick house with an English flag outside the window. And that was the classic Brexit voter. Um, and at some point, those people are also saying, well, screw you to the Scots. Um, and screw you to the Irish. Yeah. The, so um, it, is, it succeeded at some level, but it's always vulnerable, especially in America, which is such a new country, um, and its diversity is so much greater than anywhere else. Well, just look at what's happening in Spain, where this ancient identity of, of Catalonia is, is suddenly coming to the fore. Yeah, but that's geographically distinct. And I mean, America has some advantages. I mean, for example, you mentioned that, that, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, sometimes your, your, uh, sports allegiance is correlated closely with religion. Yeah. You don't have that in America. No. Um, and, and, and in that, you know, sports teams are ethnically unifying. And that's why it is troubling to some people, I think rightly, that, uh, when, when, you know, if, it, if there's actually a possibility, which I think is actually not that likely. But if conservatives, broadly speaking, could wind up being alienated from the NFL, then you would have a cultural unifier that was no longer available, a cultural integration. And you see that that's, that's happening. Um, you know, when, when the national anthem cannot unite people, where there isn't a moment of sacred, sacredness, as it were, in which that is also susceptible to tribal identity, by which I don't, I don't mean in any way to, to impugn the motives of someone like Colin Kaepernick, who I think is, 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 is inspired by exactly the right kind of motive. But still, using that occasion to do it, um, is a sign of tribalization, it seems to me. Well, I guess, I mean, one difference between you and me is you're, and this gets back to my positing nationalism versus cosmopolitanism as a big part of the divide. You you see our mission as restoring allegiance to the nation state, and whereas I have long been someone who was emphasizing that more and more critical problems are not soluble at the national level as a matter of policy, and so you're going to have to see more and more in the way of global governance. So, you know, I'm a little more ambivalent about that. I, I mean, if, if, if Certainly, if nationalism, if national allegiance means what it means in Trump country, I think it's a it's a destructive and bad thing because because they're not I, I think they're not grappling there, and for that matter, not many liberals are grappling with with the with with the true uh, policy challenges that will involve, involve collaboration with other nations, and in some sense sacrifices of sovereignty. Although I would argue that what you're doing is actually retaining sovereignty to the extent that you can by pooling kind of your, your sovereignty with other nations, but... But I, I'm a deep skeptic about the possibility of that really working, uh, because there are limits to the evolution of the human mind and spirit. The change is coming too fast for most people to adjust to. Now, the critical and obvious example is the European Union, which is a, a perfectly benign attempt to pool sovereignty um, across, uh, across all of Europe, a, a, a continent of all places, understood deeply the consequences of nationalism's dangers of, of tearing the entire continent apart. And yet it too is unlike support because at some level it cannot command the loyalty of its own citizens because they... But it also, it also overreached in the sense of uh, politicizing or, or carrying policy issues to the supranational level that did not have to be carried there. I mean, first of all, there's all this, you know, a certain amount of gratuitous, well, I, I won't get into it, but I will say that currency unification, which I didn't oppose at the time, 
But now that I see what it entailed, including it entailed logically open borders, because if you're going to have a unified currency and, and labor markets cannot, you know, so that you can't have relative devaluations of currency between nations to adjust to locally hard times. If you take that away and you take away and you don't allow labor to migrate freely between borders, you got a problem. And yet we now see that open borders just creates severe political problems, leaving aside the question of whether it should and who's right and who's wrong in this issue. It just it just it, but it, open it's borders, not surprising. open borders within the EU have always been part of the Treaty of Rome. Freedom of movement, uh, freedom of labor has been inextricable from freedom of trade. And and so that's not a new development. Yeah, but it's, it's not, not inextricable. The, the Euro. Well, I, what I would say is it's not, even if it preceded the Euro, it's actually, I would argue, it's not inextricable from free trade. We, we All kinds of countries have fairly free trade without opening up their borders. It is logically inextricable from the Euro. But in any event, my other point I think there, the, the one country that has removed itself from the EU didn't adopt the Euro, had its own currency still resisted freedom of movement across uh, well, across, across well sure i mean i mean i'm agreeing yeah. that freedom of movement politically speaking is a big part yeah. of the problem there's no doubt and of course that was all compounded by uh you know the by uh, radical islam or whatever you want to call it i mean that that it, it became intertwined with that in a way you know that made you know, people more scared than arguably they had to be, but 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 uh, they are, and uh, and that that problem kind of feeds on itself. So, um, it's you know I, anyway. I just want to clarify that I, I would want to be very judicious about which policy uh, issues you address at the international level. Uh, at the same time, I think there's a number of them we're not addressing that are uh, graver than the current so-called terrorist threat and um, in, in terms of their relevance for our national security. The other thing I'd say is, remember, traditionally, conflict among nations has been like the great problem in terms of people actually getting killed. And so, uh, you know, some, you know... But a democracy like, I don't, work. Well, Let me just give you an example that's not that relevant, but I don't like the militarization of sporting events. And what I learned recently that the Department of Defense has been paying these professional sports teams to be vehicles for these displays, you know, of, of uh, I, I, it bothered me a little. I, I mean, uh, but I digress. Go well, ahead. <laughs> I, 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 I see the possibility and I see... NFL or, or organized sports in general as essentially a, a in general an anti-tribalist thing and as much as they disperse the tribal emotions in a pretty harmless way but also buttress the nation state at the same time which seems to me I think our difference is that I think that for all its flaws the nation state is the best mechanism for democratic accountability that we have and because people still feel that they are members of the same community, therefore having a political conversation about a common fate. Uh, and once you extend that, extend that too far, people don't feel like no one in Europe really believes that they're Europeans first. Maybe a few people in Brussels or a few people uh, in the elites, but no one really does that because our identity, we need meaning and we need meaning from identity and we need identity from groups and, and, my worry is that once you create an identity that almost or two identities that split a country in two, our entire political system, especially the American political system and the something on the English political system, is extremely ill-equipped to deal with. Um, it's based upon the assumption that citizens operate qua citizens, leaving behind their other identities, can adopt a new identity of just being a citizen of a country in order to deliberate and to vote. Uh, a two-party system that can fight over ideas and adjust left and right as it goes along, as opposed to very resilient, durable, not very changeable tribal identities that create, at best, complete gridlock, um, or at worst, a sense that the losing tribe feels as if it's under sort of occupation, which is why, you know, we, we don't talk about an opposition anymore in America. We talk about a resistance 
That's now part of that is Trump, of course, but part of it is also a sense of irreconcilable differences between between this group and and the others. Um, and now I saw that, for example, at the Women's March, which I went to and supported uh, because I wanted to be part of a demonstration against the election of this monster to the presidency. Um, but I looked around me and I thought all the signage here, all the attitudes are so blue state. Uh, all the pictures of, of vaginas, the, the sort of slogans about white supremacy, the pink pussy hats. I mean, they think they're representing women. They're not. They're representing blue state women. Uh, and almost half, I mean, more white women voted for Trump than for, for, for Clinton. Um, and it was pretty evenly split overall. Uh, that was a kind of delusion, a mass delusion that somehow we represent the real country and the people who voted for this guy don't. And that, that's a separating out from yourself and the other half of the country that I think is deeper and, and less malleable than I've seen it in my lifetime in this country and, and, and gets close to, uh, you know, previous periods when things were really dodgy. Now, before we get to some of your proposed, it's not like you claim to have I solutions, don't. but some things you think might help uh, if they're doable. Let, let's get to one thing you don't uh, you don't put much emphasis on. You, uh, an approach you don't take is the common one of saying, "Look, there are a lot of people in Middle America who uh, are not entirely just dreaming up these grievances. Mm -hmm. International trade has not worked." at least clearly to their advantage. Mm -hmm. um, immigration uh, in the short term provides competition for the, the lower wage jobs, the relatively less skilled jobs mm -hmm. uh, they would like, um, and, uh, and, and so on. It's not as if I'm um, not saying that the tribal identity is somehow independent of its origins or the reasons for it. It's right. just that it can take on a life of its own. That's my concern. It can, it can, but one approach you hear about is, well, address those issues. I mean, for yeah. example, a, a far left a kind of leftish solution you don't hear much about would be to say, look, let's, let's you know, we've talked about putting labor accords in trade agreements, and we've done a little of it, but let's just get serious. Let, let, let's say you, if you want to, if you're a low-wage country that wants to uh, be in a trade agreement with the U.S., you have to agree to a certain minimum wage, or you have to agree to let labor organize. I mean, these are things that would actually alleviate uh, the pressure that free trade puts on uh, less educated workers in the United States. And the argument is that if you did enough things like this that address the, the substantive grievances, and I wouldn't say that all of their grievances are substantive in origin, but, but I think some are, um, that that's that that should be the, the, the you know address the root causes. Yes, and I think the the best way that could work is if the party that represents the other tribe took measures to actually deal with the issues that are motivating the other tribe. In other words, I think, for example, if you look at the Democrats, and here I'm going to side with with our mutual friend Mickey uh, Kaus, I think that if the Democrats were to come up with support for say E-Verify, um, it would go a long way to attempting to dissolve some of these these tribal instincts if they could say we understand that uh that immigration is having this effect we we're not in favor of illegal immigration um uh, and we're going to have stronger enforcement that isn't this stupid wall but that is actually a way in which we can protect american workers from from c competition from people who do not have a legal right to be here that would help but they can't and they didn't i mean it wouldn't be hard but they can't. Why? Because the identity politics of appealing to Latinos in general within the party has uh, has prevented them from moving on that kind of issue. So that's an issue where you could do things to help that would not be disastrous, but that the tribal identity has become so complete and that that it's impossible for either side to move. Um, or it's certainly impossible for but Democrats. It's true that a lot of the things, if you look at a lot of the grievances, um, uh, trying to address them would uh, affect the Democratic constituency, adver the coalition, con c adversely so far as you can tell. I mean, another of their grievances is affirmative action and so on. The one I mentioned on trade is one of the few that, well, it, I, it may not be one of the few. There may be a lot more, but it's one that doesn't have uh, that pro, uh, pro I mean, actually, if anything, that runs into resistance from the donor class. 
I mean, that's the problem with the Democratic Party. You've got this weird, you know, coalition, including a number of low-income, ethnically-based uh, groups, and then you've got the damn donor class. It's like, if you try to please, you know, I mean, it, it's it's a hard row to hoe in term, you know, in terms of uh, doing much of anything. Well, similarly with the Republicans um, and that donor class, it's it's uh, it's. Yeah, well, the donor, but we assume that. I mean, stereotype holds that you got a bunch of rich people in the Republican Party, you know. But right, but but, right, uh, right. but you you know the Democrats are at least as hostage. And in fact, to the extent that this breaks down as kind of cosmopolitan versus nationalist, you may have Democratic Party. Uh, you know, maybe more and more uh, the the uh, the party of the 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 affluent. Uh, you know, I mean, one thing we haven't seen yet is a real party realignment. Uh, partly because, you know, Trump had the potential to be a realigning figure. And this gets into one of your, uh, and let's move there uh, after I say this, where it gets into one of your proposed quasi-solutions. Or, uh, But, um, you know, Trump, for much of his presidency, he has just uh, done what the conservative establishment said to do as a matter of policy, Notwithstanding, the, and and he's hung on to a few issues. I mean, rhetorically, he's hung on to immigration, but substantively, he he really hasn't done what you would have predicted. Uh, su substantively, on foreign policy, he hasn't done uh, what you would have predicted. Substantively, on trade, he hasn't done what you would have predicted. He has largely uh, fallen in line with the conservative establishment as a matter of policy. So as a result, he has not challenge the basic uh, structural, you know, differences between the two parties. Now, one thing you suggest at the at the end of your piece is you say, uh, I know you're going to kill me for saying this, but a possibly, I don't know, do you call him a potentially unifying figure or what? But anyway, the scenario you, you paint is Trump doing what he has shown some signs of doing lately, which is move to the center and do business with Democrats, right? Talk about this well, uh, salvation scenario. Uh, for example, I, I, I don't see why on immigration there isn't obviously uh, a grand bargain possible. I, 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 I can see I can see e verify for the DACA uh, uh, proposal to be a completely obvious bargain, which which would help diffuse some of these emotions around it. In other words, yeah, we're going to let eight hundred thousand people who are innocent people in this country stay. And integrate them as best we can, but we're going to make sure that 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 that, that, that employers have to hire legal immigrants, not illegal ones. Now that might not even my my feeling is the Democrats, you know, there are Latinos who support that. There are many Latinos who support that because they're under they're they're especially under wage pressure from the new immigrants. Um, and you know, Trump Trump got twenty nine percent, no different than Romney. Of the Latino vote. So in other words, it's not as monolithic or as PC as people want it to be. And you could scramble it at all. I don't think of him as a unifier so much as a scrambler, a potential scrambler. And I think he could make those concessions in ways that, so for example, I think he could also uh, increase taxes on the 1% quite easily and do a huge, mon mon a huge amount for himself in terms of, uh, in terms of his politics, his own, his own base, and also reach out to some Democrats. Again, Perfectly possible within, but he doesn't seem able to. Um, I'm pointing this because I've been desperately thinking about how can we get out of this logjam? Um, because it does seem to me that this is where ethnicity comes in. I think that part of the democratic mindset has, has sort of locked onto the Teixeira Judas original. I know John has shifted his mind on this, that somehow if we just wait, we're going to have an overwhelming ethnic majority and, and we're going to win every time. And, Right. John and Rui uh, Tashira, John Judas and Rui Tashira wrote this book, The Emerging Democratic Majority, I think it was called, which is just doing the math, saying, look, Democrats have the Latinos, they have the blacks, look at the demographic trends, add it all up, we will win. So, so well, that's ahead. exactly, they, they I mean, were, they were Obama wrong. had that behind him, but Obama really, I mean, my view, was able to appeal, actually, better able to appeal to sort of the Rust Belt white people than, than Clinton was, because... He didn't run to be the first black president. He ran to be a unifier, even though he, he couldn't succeed in that endeavor. Um, whereas Hillary's, and he, and he ran to persuade people. 
Whereas Hillary's campaign, Clinton's campaign was entirely, we've got this if we keep that coalition together and just increase turnout. There was almost no effort of persuasion. So it was really just getting your own tribe out to vote that worked. And it turned out that Trump was better at getting his own tribe out than she was. And by the way, her campaign was in a certain sense almost as fear-based as his. Oh, yeah. Hers was fear Trump. And and her your assumption was exactly what you're saying. If she could get the existing coalition fearful enough, what she saw as the existing coalition, that would do it. Yeah, but she couldn't. She she so 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 there were virtually no overtures to the to the to the kind of swing. There's voters. also the possibility, Bob, and I see this particularly now watching the the political situation in England, is that the the Democrats really go hard left on a on a on an economic basis. Um and and, and shift the the emphasis away from from multiculturalism or identity and actually shift left on things like taxes, on infrastructure, on industrial policy, even on trade in some respects. And what's been surprising to me is that in Britain, that is actually the last election showed that if you actually put that on the platform, people will respond to it. And you could scramble this identity-based tribalism by cross-cutting it through class. And I think... That's kind of what I was saying when, when I was talking about a left-wing trade agreement. It's like address some substantive issues. But here the Democrats' donor base gets in the way. I mean, when I first heard reports a couple of months ago when Bannon was in the administration that he was pushing to raise taxes on rich people, something about which I had heard almost nothing from Democrats, I thought, man, if they, if the Republicans beat the Democrats to this punch... Raising taxes on rich people, that will be such an indictment of the control of the donor base over the Democratic Party. And, but, 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 I, but in any event, I think that's, uh, that's a big constraint. It is a big constraint, and it's a stupid constraint. I mean, my view, look, I'm not in favor of high taxes in particular, especially if they're not efficiently spent. But in terms of social stability, in terms of the stability of the entire system, the gains being made by the tiny few at the top are so out of proportion to anything that's happened in modern American history, certainly not since the 19th century, that we need to adjust. And we can adjust. It's not that hard. And if there's an international response, then we need to coordinate internationally to make sure that no other country soaks up all that wealth at our expense. But that can be done. Again, uh, that could also scramble the tribal identity. It seems to me, however, that within the Democratic Party, the issues of, of, of race and gender, sexual orientation, let alone gender identity, are now so fixed and immutable, especially in the younger generation, that there's no way of getting past this, really, except further defeats, um, which, which, I, which I fear. So this is the Mark Lilla thesis. Uh, and he's been uh, actually on blogging heads with uh, Glenn Larry. And I got to say, whatever you think of his thesis, I think... A symptom of the tribalism is how he's been uh, received uh, by progressives. I don't mean they have to agree with him, but it just seems to me that he's... Uh, and I haven't paid really close attention, maybe everyone. It just seems to me there's been a little too much reflexive, disrespectful dismissal of the thesis, as opposed to... Engagement. Just, just oh yeah, that's arguing tribalism. with the guy. I'm, that's what I'm saying. That, that, that is tribalism. That is, the, the tribalist will be much more concerned about policing boundaries of its own tribe than actually at some point attacking the other one. And in fact, you know, if you look at like Tanahasi's latest essay, who does he pick on? He picks on George Packer. He picks on, you know, he picks on uh, some of the most sort of of Nick Kristoff, for God's sake. If anybody is a danger <laughs> to black people, in America, it's about time Nick somebody Christoph. picked on Nick Kristoff. I mean, talk about punching a, a punching <laughs> punching a puppy. I mean, no, that, there, are, <laughs> there are worse things to worry about. Uh, uh, and, but that's what happens. Similarly, on the right, as I say in the piece, the the right's energies in policing its own ideological boundaries. You know what it what it's done over the last twenty years, and I'm not whining, but what it did. To me, what it did to someone like Trump, what it does to any dissent, really, in the past, has been brutal. And right now, the Trump people, their main obsession, really, are with the nether Trumpers, the neocons, all those people in their own camp that they want to get rid of. That's what Bannon is all about now. He's much more interested in waging war on the Republican Party to police it than he is on the Democratic Party to defeat it. And, and so tribalism is also dug both parties into a deeper and deeper hole from which it's going to be harder and harder for them to get out of. Mm -hmm. 
it's, well, it's uh, very bad too. Intellectually, the, the liberal center has been punished. I also think that it's important to mention something like Twitter in this, in this respect. Twitter is yeah. really a mass intimidation machine. It is, it has become essentially a way to intimidate people from saying what they believe and to punish people for occasional digressions. It's become a policing mechanism. And that is through a mob, really, through a massive online mob. And in mobs, the most extreme element will prevail. And one thing that tribalism has going for it right now is, is the nature of our public discourse, the inability for people to listen to the other side in any way. You know, I'm, I'm at New York Magazine and I write, and it's becoming harder and harder for a writer not to be terrified of everything he puts down on paper, uh, not to be, mm-hmm. not to be extremely cagey about talking about issues that maybe need to be talked about because the consequence is just so much so damaging for people. And, and, and I think that's absolutely vital. This you, I mean, you can criticize, you know, the old New Republic or the old blogosphere when it started, but it did genuinely seem to be a place where there was actually a premium on challenging conventional wisdom rather than completely buttressing it when it's conventional. There, there was, I got to say, I got to say, looking back at the glory days of blogs, there was more honest intellectual engagement. Uh, than you find certainly on Twitter, and you can talk about why that is, but uh, but I don't think I don't think there's much doubt that it's the uh, the case. Well, the dish, you know, um, the dish. One of the great things that I loved about the dish, uh, not to not to toot our own horn, but that we regularly featured dissent, real dissent, not phony dissent, and put me through the ringer in public plenty of times because I I genuinely wanted to encourage that kind of debate, and because I got things wrong, because everybody gets things wrong. Um, and that spirit has has collapsed, um, and and the rewards for appealing to tribal intensity are enormously greater than they used to be because because clicks really mean much more monetarily than they used to mean in terms of subscriptions uh, because the well and in terms of building a Twitter course. following yeah I mean there are you know I don't want to get into too much detail about but but look at the you know, and I just let me let me uh, plug a piece. I I, I actually uh, wrote a piece for Vox that had the misfortune of going up the same morning that the Las Vegas stuff was being reported. So Vox happily is going to republish it next week. So by the time this thing is posted, uh, it'll probably be up the second time. Anyway, it's there. <clears throat> um, I read it. Oh yeah. Okay. So you know that that uh, I I'm talking about. Uh, I'm encouraging people to realize. That when they retweet something, they are giving feedback to the to the person who's who's like building up this huge uh, following by doing nothing but tweet outrage. Right. You know, like, isn't Trump stupid? Yes, he's stupid. Could we move on to doing something about it? And 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 look, I mean, there there are certain things he does that I think are really worth calling attention to, but the 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 uh, there's just a. The, the, the goal of building a Twitter following in this environment, in a tribal environment, translates into tweeting a bunch of stuff that that just pushes emotional buttons and is often not often lacks intellectual integrity. And and um, and so I'm 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 advocating a grassroots solution. I'm trying to get people to like you know. Be mindful and uh, think carefully about what they read. Well, I, I I suggest that people just think for a minute about something that they agree with their opponents on, or or one issue in which they dissent from their own side, and just ponder it a little bit, <laughs> and just nurse it a tiny bit to realize that you are actually not simply a, a tribal member, a lemming in this great horde, but an individual uh, can actually yeah. think for him or herself. Um, but again, the trouble with that is that there's a moral, a moral quality that's being attached to wrong-headed political views. So, so for example, it's impossible to talk about race without being a good person or a bad person. And the standard for being a good person keeps getting moved to such an extent that no one can really qualify except those who, who are either lying or taking a very, very hard-line position, which means essentially the conversation ends for most human beings in the middle. Um, and that's, you know, that's profoundly, uh, disarming and, and, and disturbing. I mean, uh, the one area that I, you know, that I, I think of a certain amount of pride on this is that 
The one issue that has avoided this, and I was trying to think of the implications of that, is the acceptance of gay people, which is now a majority of Republicans as well as Democrats. This is a culture war that has shifted definitively across both tribes. Mm -hmm. One tribe less than the other, definitely, but and there are still elements in it that are obviously deeply hostile. But basically, it achieved a consensus that has stuck largely. Uh, mm -hmm. And why why did that one work? And I think the reason it worked is is the is the simple accident that gay people have spread randomly across the population. Exactly, exactly. So, so that so that everybody has to see us as part of their own possible background, their own possible family, or or, or part of their own environment, which cuts. And there was and there was a positive feedback effect. The more the more gay people who came out, the more people realized they already knew and liked a gay person. Or even had one in their family, and and so more people came out, and so on. So, but go ahead. Yeah, the paradox of that is that we succeeded. The paradox, however, is that after this extraordinary success, really, in terms of changing public attitudes, in terms of the right to marry, the right to serve your country, et cetera, et cetera, the, the current what's what's now the LGBTQ XYZ movement is to actually see the remaining obstacles as that much greater because there are fewer of them. In some ways, it seems the more progress you make, the more intolerable the injustices that remain. And and therefore, the tribalism has actually gotten worse among gay people in terms of what you can and cannot say and what you what you can and can't support. The, 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 uh, the, the diversity within the gay population, which was much more evident in the 90s and early 2000s, is now being squelched to a great extent. Um, by, you mean ideological? I mean diversity. ideological diversity. Yes, mm -hmm. um, and that's you know that's part of the tribalism too. Uh, in other words, you have to accept all this agenda or none of it whatsoever. You can't actually say, well, this yes, that no, this for that reason, no for that reason, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That becomes harder and harder. It's also harder and harder, I think, for any African American to take a nuanced position on some of these things. And what happens is, if you do take a nuanced position, you're immediately forced tribally into the other hand, into the other side. The other side will accept you and tout you as the exception that proves they're right about everything. But the nuance of the middle becomes really hard to sustain. I mean, now, in your, in your piece, you, you, you mention issues, comparable issues on the right as well. The, la the last couple are, on the, are about policing on the left. But, um, but in your piece, you do, and you've already alluded to some on the right as well so it is uh, no i think i think in fact is, in the piece i do say and people didn't really acknowledge this that i think the right has the most blame to bear in all of this i think that from gingrich onwards there was a definitely tribal feeling about that i, I got uh, i think both gingrich and fox news were just qualitative escalations yeah. Gingrich in Congress and Fox News in media were wholly new kinds of things well and and relatedly talk radio on the right i guess but but, uh, you know, even now, people say, well, there's MSNBC and there's Fox News. Well, no, Fox News is in a class of its own. I mean, for God's sake, MSNBC has Joe Scarborough as one of its stars. He was a Republican. He's pretty much of a hawk on foreign policy. I mean, MSNBC is happy to cater to progressives if it means ratings. Fox is run by ideologues and for that. Yeah, purpose. MSNBC has Hugh Hewitt, for God's sake. Um, yeah. And Fox could do that. It could even have, it won't even have, Conservatives who aren't adhering to the Trump line. That, I mean, that, it won't even have that. No, no, it, it, it's, it's totally, uh, uh, it's the Politburo. Um, the, uh, so, um, I mean, the other, let, let me, the other thing I would plug, I, I, I mean, uh, and, and, and I want to see what you think of this. Okay, so I wrote this Vox piece, uh, with Mindful Resistance in the, and, and we have this, uh, we're putting out this Mindful Resistance newsletter, which you can sign up for at mindfulresistance.net, which is, is about, if you're concerned about Trump as I am, trying to combat him in a way that does not exacerbate tribal antagonisms, since those are his right. friend. Um, I also, there's a piece in Wired that, that will probably be up by the time this, this uh, goes up. I don't know what it'll be called, but... Uh, it's about uh, mindfulness meditation and how it can, in principle, erode uh, some of the cognitive biases that, I think, sustain tribalism. You know, b biases that are just manifest as, as in as such pedestrian ways as clicking retweet without just reflecting on what feeling 
is encouraging you to click retweet? Is that a feeling you should respect? Is that a, yeah, we're right and they're assholes? Or is it something more refined? Um, and I get into you know cognitive biases and, and the, I think the underappreciated role that feelings play in triggering cognitive biases and how meditation might be helpful. So my own crusade, I guess, is... Uh, you know, metacognition, make people more aware of the biases, introduce them to practices such as meditation that can erode the biases, you know, and, uh, but uh, honestly, it's a, it's a challenge. And do you have, um, well, either comment on that, or do you want to mention other things you mentioned in your piece? It has always been a challenge to be in a democratic republic, because it requires at some level a belief in reason as a way to moderate our differences and to come to some solutions. Now, it's naive to believe that emotions aren't bound up in that entire process. Of course they are. But the, the, the challenge of a liberal democracy is to attempt to constantly place your reason in charge of your emotions. Uh, at least I know that's a, <laughs> that kind of frame is not something that that having read your, having read most of your book about Buddhism is, 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 is a necessarily helpful one, but it is one in which you can sit back from time to time and say, am I really right about this? This has made me feel really good to like this, but is it really going to help defeat what I want to defeat? Um, and that requires a great amount of restraint and self-control, and that's very hard to do. But I'm trying to say that without that, we our liberal democracy itself is is in extreme danger. Because if it just becomes no, one uh, group's feelings against another, which is then the imposition by force uh, on the other side, once you get into power, then then you've really given up the whole project of a liberal democratic idea. Um, uh, and that seems to be where we're getting. You know, that's why one administration, the main goal is with Trump is simply to reverse everything that Obama did, regardless of whether it's good or bad, whether the situation has changed, any of those things. It's just fuck him. Um, so I'm allowed to say, I am allowed to say that on, on blogging heads like this. Yes, you can go further. Anything <laughs> else you'd like to say? <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, I, I agree. I, I mean, think, I... Um, I think also a certain amount of, you know, I, I, I'll, I've got a limb on this. I do think that one of the things that has hurt us in a way is that Christianity, as it was long practiced and understood in this country, has, has kind of collapsed. And what I mean by that kind of civic Christianity is an understanding of our own fallibility and the need for mutual forgiveness, the sense that kindness and, and generosity are important virtues, um, and that is conducive in those civil ways to a more uh, rational and peaceful existence. I think, it's, I think that one for, people easily forget, for example, that the whole concept of toleration as it came, was, came out of a Christian tradition, came out of Locke, using Christianity against itself, in a way, by saying, look, Jesus was all for uh, for loving the other, for reaching out to the other. When, when why Now you're so certain about what Jesus says, you're oppressing the other, you're surely misguided about this. And, and and that form of Christianity, which I think definitely definitely influenced the public culture in Anglo-American political debate, has so withered that it's been replaced by a kind of paganism on the right, which is a brutal worship of force, uh, cynicism, uh, and, and loathing of the other. And by a kind of atheism on the left that is, that is not, uh, not that conducive to mutual forgiveness when it comes to religious people. Um, and, and I, so that's when I come down to mutual forgiveness in the end, or, or what you might call magnanimity, just the understanding that, so for example, we can, we can see the racism and we can call it that and not shy from that among some Trump supporters. But it takes another step to say, well, why are they so afraid? What are the circumstances that have driven them to this point? How can we alleviate that? How can we not forgive them, but understand them? And well, the, the, uh, see, that is the sticking point is the way the human mind equates understanding with absolution. I mean, I mean, I know you're saying we should move to forgiveness and that's fine, but the problem is if you just ask them to understand the enemy, and I run into this with my my ideology on the war on terror. It's like, let's think about being a Muslim teenager in Paris, right. you know, and you run into trouble, right? Oh, are you saying they're not to blame? You run into trouble from the right. 
Now I say this about Trump supporters and I run into trouble from the left. They say, oh, you're saying racists aren't to blame? I'm saying whenever you have a problem, try to understand what led to it as step one. And but people cannot separate just the process of understanding what what made someone do something from the question of forgiveness and absolution and and just deal with them sequentially. Um, But the truth truth is a successful secular politics really tries to keep that absolute moralism at bay in order to resolve human nature as it is. Um, and, uh, and that's been, that's very hard to do also because again, I think Twitter and all this stuff, because there's such an avenue now to morally posture, to, 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 to publicly portray yourself as on the side of good rather than of evil. I mean, these t-shirts I see in Provincetown all summer, love conquers hate. <laughs> I mean, how many of them live that? Is well, that the no, question, the question is, ask? how fucking smug can you get? I mean, the <laughs> idea that... <laughs> I mean, the idea that's going to persuade... You, you realize we have a two-fucking limit on blogging okay. heads okay, here. I'm done. You All keep, right. you, you... But it's just the sanctimony <laughs> of it, the self-righteousness of it, the sense in which there are no arguments here on the other side. There's just iniquity on the other side, and that we're going to win because we're so obviously full of love, even though, frankly, they're as human as anybody else. We're as full of hate as people we think of as haters. We're all humans. I think understand yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, I'm yeah. on board. Uh, with, as I understand what you're, you're, you're saying, it's it's real time. I mean, I'm in a way in a privileged position. You know, three of my four siblings voted for Trump. I've said this before. I've said it so much, people probably think I'm like bragging. Oh, but my dad and my brother um, voted for Brexit. Yeah. So there you go. Um, and once you see. I think, that, I think the family is the other option that I, I'd like to talk about because so many of these divisions actually between cosmopolitan and, 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 and sort of nationalist or whatever you want to call that, urban rural, are within families, surprisingly. And yeah. one thing that worked with the marriage question, the gay question, was honest arguments within families and attempt to reconcile within those families because there you already have a common bond that you can fight over and discuss, or at least move forward. And we tend to, at this point, rather than talking to our own family members and listening to them and trying to have a civil conversation, we're yelling at them on Facebook. <laughs> They're unfriending us, or we're, or we're just being shocked at the things they say and write, as opposed to engaging them. There we have an opportunity to overcome this through an existing institution that already commands our loyalty and love. Um, and so the family discussion seems to me incredibly important. It is, although this issue is so divisive, it's the kind of thing that divides families. Yeah. I mean, I had a family reunion, uh, and basically everyone there understood. I was there for like five days. Everyone there understood we could not bring up Trump. This is this summer, Andrew, and we were there. There was like 30-something people for five days, and you did not hear the word Trump. Isn't that, I mean, how amazing is that? Because I knew, I, I just, uh, I mean, I take your point that in a context of love, you should be able to speak candidly and yet, you know, uh, lovingly and forgivingly. But I knew it would be a mistake. I, I just knew I would go, I, I, I would say things I, you know, I, it would not be pretty. <laughs> and everyone knew that. So we just, it was like an armistice. It was just I, like. I went to, I and, went to and, dinner party this, this summer where we decided we were not going to talk about Trump. It was the dullest, most boring, most inane dinner party. Yeah, well, I, I've been I, felt, I felt the urge to mention the name all the time, but because uh, it's all I want to talk about. I, I, I think, to be honest, you failed. Uh, you need to do it. Yeah, I can see that, but well, there's failure and there's failure. I, I think you know, know thyself is an important injunction, and I just, I, I think it might have been worse than what it was. If I just don't think I, w- I have enough self control, okay. honestly, to for it to have been a constructive. Uh, conversation. I mean, especially when it's like one on, I mean, the one sibling who didn't vote for Trump was not there and her family was not there. So it's like one against 30. And, and that's, you know, anyway, I don't want to. I like those odds with you, Bob. But what I'm thinking (laughs) is if you, if if you can't, if you can't do it, who the hell can? I mean, that's how deep it's Mm -hmm. gone. I mean, uh, so. I know it's, it maybe was, yeah, it's depressing. You're right. It's I depressing. Should, I should feel ashamed. I feel bad. You, you're 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 leaving me feeling worse about myself than than uh, you found me, which is good. Um, 
So listen, Andrew, uh, we should do this again, and we should keep doing this until we solve this gosh darn it's problem. A huge, I think it's um, the problem, to be honest with you. It is the problem. I, I, I wrote this piece because I really felt it's the only piece that needs, I need to write right now because it's... it's uh, you should write it again and again. I mean, I, I mean, different aspects of it. And, 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 you know, you should create conversations with people. I mean, we try to do some of that on Blogging Heads. I was looking back at my recent Blogging Heads, and I've like had the last 12 conversations I've, I've had, three of them were Trump supporters, and I'm proud of that. But, you know, um, you, you, should, you, should, uh, you should make this your beat. Yeah. And, and uh, you've, done the, you've done the macroscopic piece. You've done the, the big picture, but, but I, I think you should, you should do a lot of micro... Uh, a lot of micro pieces. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll take that encouragement and, and do, do more of it. Okay. Well, again, thank you. People should read your, your piece in New York and uh, should read all your pieces in New York. And uh, remember, love conquers hate. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it does. We shouldn't lose sight of that, but I take your point about the t shirts. I'm a Christian. I just can't stand those t shirts. I, I, it's like, no. <laughs> you believe that in your heart and practice it. Don't fucking walk. Sorry, I've gone over now. So that, uh, that's a limit. Got to cut okay. you off. Cheers. All right. Thanks, Andy. See you.